Okay, so the first one, is that a ratio or not? That is a ratio because they have the same units. They're both teeth. Second one, ratio or not? That is a rate because it's two different units. Number three is a ratio. And number four, that is also a rate, two different units. So then go back and reduce any ratios. So for number one, the teeth cancel out. Both eight and 10 can be divided by two, so that's a four to five ratio. Three is also a ratio. Inches divide out. 42 and 28 both divide by 14. You can divide by two and then seven if you want to. It's gonna be a three to two ratio. Can I reduce that to one and one half? Say no. No. For a ratio, you have to compare two numbers. We can't break it into a mixed number. It stays as an improper fraction. Now for our rates, a unit rate, all we do is divide by the denominator. So we're gonna divide by three. So that divides out the three, that becomes one hour. 180 miles divided by three is 60 miles per one hour or miles per hour. 4,500 revolutions in nine, in nine minutes. Again, we divide by that denominator of nine. So the nines cancel out, that's just one minute. 45,000 divided by nine is 500 revolutions in one minute, so it's revolutions per minute. The fraction in a rate, when you convert it to a union rate, kind of gets pushed into the units. Any questions there? Okay, so what we're gonna look at today, actually I don't wanna do one more example here, just to make sure we're on track here. So, a car dealership, sold 40 vehicles last month. Six were recalled. Find the ratio of non-recalls to recalls. I'll give you just a few seconds. Okay, so we have 40 vehicles, six were recalled. How many were not recalled? There we go, 40 minus six is 34 that were not recalled. So the non-recalls to recalls are 34 to six. And of course, that'll reduce by two, giving me a 17 to three ratio. Okay, so today let's take a look at what we can do with that. If that ratio is fairly common, 17 to three, in a year where the dealership sells 714 vehicles. Eh, let's be, I'll be nice to you. We'll go 720 vehicles. How many recalls should they expect? Now here, this is, of course, non-recalled to recalled. Kind of like labeling our uh, percent problems when we did them. Here, do we have the non-recalled number? No, we have the total. So we're looking for the recalled 
but we don't have the non-recalled, we have the total. So we need to adjust this. The non-recalled or the recalled the total, if 17 were, re were not recalled and three were recalled, that's a total of 17 plus three is 20. That's a 20 to three total to recalled ratio. Or three out of 20 if you want to do it at recalled the total ratio. It doesn't matter. It'd probably be more comfortable for me, more natural for me to do a three out of 20. So three out of 20 are the recall to total. So, good morning. We know the number of total is 720 vehicles. So we're looking for the number recalled. How would we find that missing number? Well, there's a couple ways we could go about it. We could look at what would you multiply 20 by to turn it into 720. Okay. You could do that and get 60 per month. Basically, these, these fractions have to be equivalent. So we're looking at equivalent fractions. So 20 times 36 would give us 720. We have to do 3 times 36 as well would give us 108. So we would expect 108 out of that 720 vehicles to be recalled. Now this is kind of tedious. I mean, looking at this, how many of you knew off the top of your head that you'd multiply 20 by 36 to get 720? Probably not right there for you. I mean, you could find it by going back and doing 720 divided by 36, or divided by, not 20, but divided, divided by 20, not 36. Gives us that 36, so then that 36 is what we have to multiply the top number by. Do you remember with percents what our shortcut was for finding that missing number? To find that missing number, we cross multiply and divide. What's happening here, we're taking this number divided by that number, that's the 720 divided by 20, and then we're multiplying the top by that result. So it's 720 divided by 20 and then times multiplying the three by that. Well, we're just changing the order a little bit. We're gonna multiply before we divide. Three times 720 divided by 20 is the same operations, just in a different order. So we are multiplying, three times 720 is 2160, divided by the 20 is 108. What this really comes from, another way of looking at this, is that this, from a process called cross multiplication. And cross-multiplying just states that when you have two fractions that are equal or two ratios that are equal, like you might acknowledge that two-thirds and ten-fifteenths are equivalent fractions, right? The diagonal products have to be equal. Well, that, they're called the cross-products. So on a diagonal... 3 and 10 are diagonal with each other. What's 3 times 10? 30. 2 and 15 are diagonal with each other. What's 2 times 15? 30. Those are equal. Well, why do they have to be equal? Well, if we look at this strictly from an equation point of view, A over B equals C over D. If I wanted to rearrange this, I could multiply both sides of this by D. That would cancel out that D, wouldn't it? Multiplying by D over here, that would give me A times D over B equals C. Well, if I want to get rid of the B, I multiply by B, that would cancel that out. I multiply B on the other side. I've got A times B equals C, or A times D equals C times B. A times D equals C times B. Those are the diagonal products or cross products. So when I have a, a ratio like that that I need to keep consistent, for example, um, let's say that we have a gear ratio that we need. 
And that gear ratio has to be a five to three ratio. And we have a motor that has a, a, a gear on it with 21 teeth. So the motor always goes on bottom. The driving gear goes on bottom. So we'll let that be X. So technically, using the cross multiplication, we would have 5 times 21, which is 105. And 3 times X, which is 3X. So 3x equals 105, and we solve the equation by dividing by 3. x equals 35. Well, we know that to solve this, it's always going to be just dividing by this one, right? So that's where that process, cross, multiply, and divide, comes from. It's just a shortcut. You multiply the two that are on the diagonal, and you divide by the one that is diagonal to our missing number, to our variable. So let's say that you drive, oh, let's go 72 miles on three gallons of gas. How far can you drive on 10 gallons? Well, this is a rate, but it still can fit into a proportion like that. 72 miles and 3 gallons. doesn't matter which one goes on top. We're used to seeing miles over gallons, so I'm going to put it that way. 72 miles over 3 gallons. Now, on the other side, since this is a proportion and we're dealing with a rate, the units have to stay the same. Miles were on top here. We need miles on top over here. Gallons are on bottom, so we need gallons on bottom. So where's the 10 going to go? On bottom, it's 10 gallons. So then we will cross multiply. 72 times 10 is 720. Now if I wanted to be strict with the units, it would be miles times gallons at this point. And then I'm going to divide by 3 gallons. So the gallons divide out, leaving us with just miles. 720 divided by 3 is 240. So 10 gallons would take you 240 miles if 3 gallons takes you 72 miles. So let's say that you need to have... A, you're working at a job and you're producing parts, and you are required to have a reject to total ratio of no more than five out of 300. What is the maximum allowable rejects for a batch of 1,380 parts? I'm going to have you guys try that in your notes. So we have that ratio. We can have five rejects out of 300 total parts. I'm going to label that. The five does represent the rejects. 300 is total parts. I'm labeling it because well, there are situations where you might list the good parts down here, and we want to make sure that what we have is matching up. So the 1,380 represents total parts. The whole batch is all the parts. So that does represent total parts. We can put that on bottom. So now we will cross, multiply, and divide. 5 times 
180 divided by 300. Gives us 23. She'd be allowed up to 23 rejected parts in that batch. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's say you need to plant 40 trees. It takes thirty minutes to plant. The first eight. How much more time will it take to finish? I'm going to give you guys a minute to try that one in your notes. Okay, so here we have. 30 minutes for eight trees. We want to know how much longer it's going to take. Well, we're looking at this. Are we going to use the 40 trees? No. We're going to use... Forty minus eight, the thirty-two trees. There are thirty-two trees left. So what we're looking at here, this is what's already done. We're looking at what's left. We're not looking at what's total, what the total time would be. If we're asked how much is the total time going to take, well then we would use all forty trees. But we're asked how much time is left to finish. So we're only looking at the trees that are left. So that's going to be 30 times 32 divided by 8, which is going to give us 120 minutes. If you wanted to, you can convert that to two hours. We also have geometric applications of this. Similar shapes. I'm just going to do triangles. We have triangles that can be enlarged or reduced. Let's take this one and enlarge it. Pretend those look like that big one's an enlargement of the little one. I'll tell you that that angle's the same and those angles are the same. So we know that those are similar. If I know the dimensions of one triangle, let's say that I tell you this here is 8 inches. We're going to call this one 16 inches and 20 inches. If I tell you that this here has been enlarged to 10 inches, I can find those missing dimensions. What I need to find is two sides, the before and after, or from one triangle to the other, that represent the same side, but I know the number for them. And here that would be the 8 inch and the 10 inch. Those represent the same side. One is in the smaller version, one's in the enlarged version. So, in this enlargement, the 8 inches became 10 inches. That same ratio has to hold for the other sides. So, for X, now X is from the same figure as the 10, so it has to go on bottom with the 10. They're both in the after triangle, if you think of this as an enlargement. What's going to go above the X? 16 is the same side from the other triangle. So we find x here by cross multiplying and dividing. 
10 times 16 divided by 8 makes this 20. So x is 20 inches. Now we could use that same ratio, 8 becomes 10, to find y. Now is y going to go on top or bottom? Still on bottom. It's still from the same figure as the 10. What goes above the y? The 20 is the same side from the other figure. Good. So now we cross multiply and divide there. 10 times 20 is 200. Divided by 8 is 25. So y is 25 inches. These similar figures are actually quite useful. Let's, well, because it's me, we'll take a little bit of a twisted look at this. Tom's not here today, so we're going to pick on him a little bit. Yeah, we'll try that a little bit better. Let's say Tom has a tree in his yard that he wants to cut down. Yeah, no criticisms on the artwork, please. He can't drop it in this direction because, now let's say there's a power line in that direction. So he's got to drop it towards his house. But he's not sure if it's going to hit his house or not. Do you? Try to squeeze him in. Oh, sure. I've watched a guy do it without any sort of apparatus where he had like six feet between a house and a shed and he was able to drop it right in that without, I mean, it, Pretty impressive. Well, Tom wants to make sure that this is not going to hit the house. So what he's going to do is he's going to try to estimate the height of this tree. This time that's not a gear. It actually is the sun. And the sun shines down on the tree. Now my drawing skills are terrible, but we're going to. And the tree casts a shadow. I don't want it to hit right at the bottom of the So the tree cast a shadow here. So the shadow of that tree from the center of the base of the tree measures out 48 feet. What does that tell us? Well, let's say Tom is exactly six feet tall. So that sun shines down on Tom and casts a shadow as well. Tom's shadow is four point, well, we'll keep it simple. Tom's shadow is four feet. So now, how tall does the tree have to be? We'll let eight be the height of the tree. Well, there's two ways I can set this up. I can put the shadows in one ratio, and I can have the heights in the other. Or I could have Tom in one ratio and the tree in the other. We're going to do it both ways just to show you that it works. Now, if, if I do shadows in one ratio and heights in the other, I'm going to put Tom on top and the tree on bottom. What's Tom's shadow length? Here, four feet. What's Tom's actual height? 
six feet. What's the tree's shadow length? 48. And we're looking for its actual height, like that, right? So we cross multiply. 48 times 6 divided by 4 gives us 72 feet. Well, let's go down here. If we did Tom in one ratio and the tree in the other, well, then we would have to have the height on top or bottom, either one, and the shadow in the other spot. So what is Tom's height? Six foot, shadow, four foot. What's the tree's height? H, that's what we're looking for, right? And its shadow is 48. Notice, even though this proportion is set up very differently, what we're going to be multiplying is still 6 times 48 divided by 4. It's the same calculation. Because what's important in a proportion is that you match things up. There are relationships in both directions. Here, these two numbers represented Tom. These two numbers represented the tree. There's a, re a relationship going horizontally there across the rows. But there's also this relationship. Both of these two numbers represented the shadow. Both of these two numbers represented their actual height. So there's a relationship going up and down as well. There's a relationship in both directions. Here, all we did was change the direction of the relationship. These two are both shadows. These two are the actual heights. These two represented Tom. These two represented the tree. So the key to a proportion is not where you put things. It's making sure those relationships hold in both directions. Doesn't matter which direction you put each relationship as long as it's there in one direction or the other. Now these proportions can get a little bit more complicated. Instead of just having, you know, X being the missing number, we might have something like X plus 7 over 24 equals Oh boy, let's do fifteen over eighteen. Hopefully that works. Now here it isn't just one piece of the proportion that's missing. It's a piece within a part of the proportion that's missing. Now there's a couple of ways I could handle this. I could solve instead of solving for x, I could solve for x plus seven. That's going to equal my cross product. 24 times 15 is 360. And then divided by 18 is 20. But remember, that's not x. That is x plus 7. So now to solve for x, i got to solve that equation. x plus 7 equals 20. So I have to do what to find x? Subtract the 7 x equals 13. I have found through the years students end up making quite a few mistakes if they try to do it that way. The big mistake they make is they add the 7 instead of subtracting the 7. They forget that they're working with an equation. But remember that cross multiply and divide is really just kind of a shortcut. The full process is cross multiplying and setting them equal. 24 times 15 is still 360. But instead of just dividing by 18, we can cross multiply this way. We get 18 times x plus 7. And those have to be equal. Eighteen times x plus seven has to equal three sixty. Now we see the parentheses. There's nothing to do in the parentheses. We're going to multiply by the 18. 18 times x is 18x. 18 times 7 is 126, I believe. Equals 360. And then? What's next? Subtract 126. 
So 18x equals 234. And then divide by 18. What's that give us? X equals 13? I hope so, because that's what we had before, right? X equals 13. This might be a little bit more work, but I do find that students make fewer mistakes when they do it out the long way like that. We might even have something like this. Come on. So here we have That's not going to work. I did something wrong there. Let me try that again. Some days the little hamster stumbles on the wheel. Let's do this. That'll work. Okay, so looking at this one here. Now, it's not x plus or minus something. It's five times the x. But we can do the same thing. We can cross multiply. 15 times 42 is 630. Then we cross multiply the other direction, the other cross product. 5x times 21 is 105x. 105x equals 630 can be solved by dividing by 105. x equals 6. Or we could run into something like this. This one here, there is no way we could cross multiply and divide because, well, there isn't that third number. But we can do the full cross multiplication. 4 times 9 is 36. Going the other way, x times x is x squared. So we know that x squared equals 36. Now we could solve that. How do we get rid of the squared? The opposite of squared would be square root. So that becomes x equals 6 we're going to go with. Now we know that it could be positive or negative 6, but we'll leave it with just a positive. We'll talk more about square roots and the possible possibility of a second answer later in the course. Any questions? Okay, well, we do have a few minutes left, but that's really all the material we have. So, remember, there is that quiz from yesterday that is due tonight. It's Thursday night. At 11.59 p.m. And there is that homework from yesterday that will be due on Monday. So these are the assignments that were assigned yesterday. I'm just repeating them for you. Any questions? Okay. Well, you guys...